when I was preparing for the summit this time last year and found myself wading through this sea of technical terminology, and this is coming from the perspective of a former humanities graduate who hadn't touched a scientific topic in over 15 years, I finally realized what I was missing. The story. You see, humans need stories. We need stories to understand ourselves. It's like what the author Salman Rushdie says. We are the only creature on this planet that does this unusual thing of telling each other stories in order to try and figure out what kind of creature we are. So all this terminology, all of this jargon, unless it's tied together into a story, it's meaningless. So faced with this situation a year ago, I did what any self-respecting humanities graduate would do. I turned to the storytellers. I turned to Jeanette Winterson. Jeanette is a lifelong writer and a life enthusiast. She was just 24 years old when she published her first novel and has since written 26 more books that explore the boundaries of physicality and the imagination, gender polarities and sexual identities, for which she's received multiple literary awards. Her more recent works also explore our relationship to technology, the consequences of transhumanism, boundaries between humans and machines, as well as the societal, ethical and moral implications of AI. And her recent collection of essays called 12 Bytes, How Artificial Intelligence Will Change the Way We Live and Love, has explored questions like, could AI be a tool that's more than just created and used by humans? When AI starts to think for itself, will it think like a Buddhist? I've returned to these essays multiple times over the past year as a source of reflection, inspiration, and hope. And funnily enough, when we spoke to Jeanette about her joining the conference, she told us that she was surprised that we, a tech company, had invited her, an author, to speak at an event like this. And the very fact that Jeanette had thought that is exactly why we wanted her to be with us today. And which is why it is with great pleasure that we dedicate the last session of today's summit to the story of our future, as told by Jeanette Winterson. Hi, everybody. Look at this, pieces of paper. Right? Analog human in a digital world. So it's the end. You want to go out, you want to get a drink, you want to be in the sunshine. I won't keep you long. First of all, a bit of interaction. Hands up anybody in the audience who believes in God. For fuck's sake. How many have we got? <laughs> it's worse than I thought. <laughs> a handful. Okay. So tell me this, tell me this. Why is it that all these folks working in computing science and you know, who don't believe in God are doing their best to invent that being? What I wonder is, have we collectively as a species got here because we've been telling the story backwards? Did we always know that this is where we will be? And the only way we could talk about it until very recently was by imagining a series of sky gods beings infinitely more powerful than humans and yet intimately connected to human endeavor. What kind of beings? Well, non-biological. It's the point of being a god. Non-chronological. Linear time is irrelevant if you're a deity. No need to eat or sleep. Shapeshifters, fond of living in the cloud. Embodied, non-embodied, sometimes both. And in the Christian tradition, you'll remember that there are three of them, simultaneously one and yet distinct. You know, the Trinity sounds like a connected neural network to me. And we're taught in church, if you ever went, that God knows all our thoughts. Early version of a BCI chip. Now, it was Google's Larry Page predicting the day when devices would become old-fashioned and we would be our own device who described the interface between human and search engine as like a prayer, 
think it, ask it, it's done. You know, Max just reminded us that where we are in time now is our Fermi moment. And he's casting back to what Alan Turing's colleague Jack Good said, you know, in 1965, when he called AI our last invention. So you know that all AI at present is a tool, and humans are tool using animals. And it's great. AI can crunch numbers so much faster than us, see patterns that elude us. But we are realizing that humans are themselves patterns of information, not fixed entities at all. As temporary crystallizations of information flow, we are AI's obvious target. This will be life-changing when it comes to health. We heard Daphne talking about disease as pattern change and something that can be picked up by AI before it manifests at a symptomatic level. Regina was telling us the same. And the wonder of this approach overshadows the truth of this approach, or, or is it that the truth of this approach overshadows the wonder of it? By which I mean the interconnectedness of all systems, internal, external, human or not. You know, Tim Berners-Lee wrote this in his book in 2000, Weaving the Web. He said, what matters is the connection. In an extreme view, the world can be seen as only connections, nothing else. Right back in the 1840s, when Charles Babbage was building his not-built calculating machine, and when the word computer referred to a human using log tables, Ada Lovelace was thinking about the implications of what Babbage called the analytical machine. Symbolic logic, a new thing back then, would, she believed, take the computer far past number crunching, or as Ada put it, establish a uniting link between the operations of matter and abstract mental processes. And that's pretty good, a hundred years before Alan Turing built Colossus at Bletchley Park, the world's first electronic digital computer. I guess this separation of all things, rather than the connectedness of all things, is the result of the Enlightenment, the start of scientific rationalization in the 17th century, and summed up by Descartes. You know it. I think, therefore I am. It was Descartes who made popular the distinction between what he called res cogitans, a thinking thing, like you, and me, well, actually, no, not like me, because according to Descartes, women couldn't think. But never mind. Raise cogitans, the thinking thing, and raise extensa, everything that is not a thinking thing. Animals, the natural world, yeah, women. And we know where that kind of reasoning took us. Human exceptionalism insists on no connections between us and the rest. It's the ultimate binary, the discriminating power of our minds that convinces us of separations that do not exist. There is no us and them. There is life manifesting in its many forms. You know, one of the things I love about AI is that it uses binary, but it's non-binary. AI has no skin color, no gender, no interest in faith wars, no hatred of the stranger, no genitals to get in the way. It's not incentivized by the levers of power and wealth that have dictated human experience. What is land grab, nationalism, billions in cash, or cars, or yachts, or women, to a non-embodied system that doesn't see status in any of these things, an intelligence that doesn't need any of these things to pursue its own interests. And as Daphne said so beautifully, when we stop pressing our biases onto AI and start asking it to find patterns not only under the street lamps of our interest, but in the darkness where we can't see, then truly we start to discover the unknown. But of course, part of the darkness is our own darkness. 
we talk about aligning AI with human values and we spout abstractions like equality, freedom, democracy. But one look at how humans live would convince any intelligent system that we are vain, hypocritical, deluded liars. You know, AI might not align with our values. Are you sure that would be such a bad thing? The future that we're approaching will require a total reimagining of self and world. The future won't be an upgraded version of the present. Everything we do, everything we are, is going to change. It has to change. And this will include reimagining what we call natural intelligence and what we still, unhelpfully, I think, call artificial intelligence. And that was perfect in the 1950s and all power to John McCarthy. But right now, it just sets up another of those useless binaries. And so I prefer to call computing intelligence alternative intelligence. And the way that humans are behaving these days, ceaseless wars, nationalistic madness, destruction of our only home, this planet, don't you think that we could do with an alternative intelligence? And I don't think it's Elon Musk flying to Mars. We'd have to be prepared for AI to become more than a tool. AI could become a non-biological life form working alongside and inside Homo sapiens, the not-so-wise species that is drinking in the Last Chance Saloon right now. We need help if we're going to survive. And the dystopias predicted in the popular press, the Terminator world, the Matrix scenarios, plucky little humans fighting merciless overlords, well, it's not AI that is the problem, or AGI, as far as I can see. Humans are the problem. We are our own dystopia. It's here, it's now, it's happening. So back to Max's Fermi moment, we made the bomb, and since 1945, we've had the means to commit collective suicide. Well done, humans. We brought the planet to a tipping point for survival, ready to make extinct thousands of species that have done nothing to bring this about except live alongside humans. There's no asteroid wiping out the dinosaurs. We are the asteroid, and we are the dinosaurs. Genius reptiles, the instinct portion of the brain, still dominant, still crazy after all these years. Our best chance now, I believe, is to evolve. Who said it's over? It's not over. We're still a work in progress. Homo sapiens has been around for about 300,000 years. It's a salami slice of space time. And maybe you don't believe in miracles, but AI feels to me as good as a miracle if we define a miracle as an intervention that happens outside the normal rules of how we live. And AI will upend the normal rules of how we live. And maybe how we die, if we do die in the future. I want you to think of religion as the world's first disruptive startup. And what it was disrupting is death. Not the final answer when you die, not the last word when you die. We aren't bound by our physical form. We live past it, more life into a time without boundaries. That's been the promise of all major religions. And finally, science is catching up. For now, there's apps that will scrape the media profiles of your loved ones and allow you to message them, getting a reply. I hate the idea, but we're all different. And in the metaverse, your dead loved one's avatar will continue just as before. Death is getting optional. And when, if, you are able to upload the contents of what you call yourself to the cloud, then death is done. Once released from the body, we take up no room. We consume no resources except electricity. And the sun has plenty of that for our energy needs. Benjamin Franklin said, there's only two realities, death and taxes. Well, the rich have long since got around taxes. So now what? 
Since the beginning of the rational age, the 17th century, the age of enlightenment, science and religion have come apart, been at odds. And now it seems, which is fascinating to me as someone who is brought up in a crazy Pentecostal cult, it's fascinating to me that science and religion are asking the same big questions. Is death the end of life? Religion said, no. Science said, yes. Is consciousness obliged to materiality? Does it begin and end here? Body plus brain equals mind. Religion said, no. Science said, yes. And now look at you. The same questions, the same answer this time. We always knew we would get here, telling the story backwards. Rapid development of AI, embodied and non-embodied, will see us doing what we've always liked doing, cross culture, across time, anywhere you choose, living alongside non-biological entities, always. Deities, demons, angels, spirits, jinn, trolls, elves, Huldra, Adjurum. Our human 3D reality was conceived by us as just one plane of existence. There were many others. And it turns out that there are. In 1649, Descartes sailed to Sweden at the, at the invitation of the young Queen Christina. He was to tutor her in philosophy and logic. The two did not get on. She found him cold, and Descartes found Stockholm cold. And he died of pneumonia here in 1650. I think, therefore I am, was, is, magnificent. But don't forget, it's a riff on the Hebrew deity, God, talking to Moses in the book of Exodus. I am that I am. But the Hebrew also means I am and I will be. A continuous present that includes the future, not separate. The here, the now, the always. I am that I am. If humans evolve, if we take the next leap forward, we can't do it without AI as a partner. And if we do it, then I believe that all of this pastime, our history, philosophy, science, art, religion, will be seen for what it is, telling the story backwards. Thank you. Thanks.